You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Give to each man according to his way, according to the results of his deeds. We're not saved by works, but once we're saved, uh, I like the way Dr. Uh, Mistler talks about it. Once you're saved, Jesus asks the question, what have you done with it lately? Are we living for him? Are we serving him? Does it... Does being saved, being a follower of Jesus, make us want to be obedient to what he says, or are we busy doing our own thing in disobedience to what he says? Jesus did all the work necessary to save you from the oppression of sin, as well as the eternal destruction it brings. When you place your trust in Him for that salvation, it's all on Him to grant and maintain your salvation. You don't have to get right before or even after you get saved, but you'll want to. As Pastor Ken will point out in today's message, a desire to do good works and avoid sin is a natural result of salvation. You'll want to honor the grace and love you were freely given. Well. Let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 22 as he continues his message, Behold, I am coming quickly. You, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night nor of darkness, so let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. We don't know the exact day, the exact hour, but we know the time. Jesus held the Pharisees accountable for knowing the time of his first coming. And they didn't, they didn't pick up on that. So Jesus is also saying, because we are believers and we can see what's going on and we're studying what's in the book of Revelation, we also can kind of pick up on this is what it's going to be like at the end of the age. We're, we need to be alert and sober. So the term here in chapter 22 where it says, shortly be done, this phrase, is literally what it is necessary to do quickly, okay? And it's a noun. In verse 7 of chapter 22, it's an adverb. Same root, meaning quickly. The thought is that when the action comes, according to Dr. Walford, it will be sudden. In other words, we all see the the signs, but most of the world doesn't. And then one day, it happens. And all of a sudden, we're not here. And people are coming to the door of the church wanting to know, you know, what happened. Uh, and there'll probably be a group of folks who will show up. Uh, I don't know. They may have to go down the street to find anybody who can tell them, but um, they're going to want to know. And we've talked about that. Uh, and when it happens, it'll be sudden. It'll, it, 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 it'll be fulfilled at that time. There's, this is the message of warning to the world, but it's also to us that we should be aware of the times that we live in and be looking for his soon return because he is coming very, very quickly. Not only is Jesus coming very soon for his church, But to encourage us to study what we've been studying for the last year or so in the book of Revelation, he repeats what he said back in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. He says in verse 7 here of chapter 22, Behold, I'm coming quickly. And then he says, by the way, blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. We get a promise of a blessing, a special blessing again. I mean, it wasn't enough to get it at the beginning of the book, but we get it again at the end. There's a special blessing that's available only to those who read, hear, and heed what is in the book. That's the hard part, heed. You know, we have to, because there's several things in here that, oh, that's going to be kind of hard to do, Lord. Well, his coming's imminent. We fully understand the plan. We've, we've been studying it. And because we do, and we've read and we've heard, we have that special blessing because this, if, if you want a book that honors Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation does it more than any other book. I mean, he is king, he is Lord, he is over everything. He's the only one who's worthy to open the scrolls. He's the only one who can take the deed of planet Earth because he personally paid for it. So John, as he's going through this and reporting what he's saying, what he has seen and where he is now in verse 7, he's a little overwhelmed. He's going to make a mistake. That's okay. I don't think I'd be any different. I think I'd be a little overwhelmed too. But Jesus is coming quickly. And for those of us who are looking for him, just that fact alone should drive us to obedience to what it is he asks us to do. 
to tell others to be obedient to, to what he asks us, to, to be faithful, to just be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That's what he's looking for. It's this obedience that's the source of the blessing. I don't think there's any blessing. Can, I agree with, with Dr. Coster on this one. I don't think there is any blessing for us to expect and guess when the, when the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place and where it'll be. I don't think there's a blessing connected with that. But there is a blessing for being faithful and following the Lord and making sure that we're not there for that and we're telling all our friends and neighbors and loved ones about the Lord so that they're not here for that either. Because we don't want them to be here for that. The blessed are those who wash their robes through faith in Christ and faithfulness in Christ. That's what it's all about. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 22. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. He wants to make sure that we know who it is who sees this. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. That's really kind of formal. I, I kind of see the angel as going, oh, wait a minute. There's somebody else who got in big trouble when, he, when, he, when that happened. No, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and, and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who heed the words of this book, worship God. Because you know, imagine you're a faithful follower of Christ. You're one of his divine beings. You're one of the heavenly host. And somebody drops to, to worship and you're going like, oh, somebody else did that and he accepted it and his name's Lucifer and he's not in a good place. No, 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 don't do that. I understand that viewpoint that that angel would have. But John's an eyewitness, okay? He is a time traveler. We have to stop and think about that too. The Bible has several people who were time travelers. Isaiah was one, Daniel was one, so's John. They've actually been transported through time and back again. So he's, he's been transported to see these things, and he's been trying to explain them to us in a first century mindset, knowing what he knows, having never seen Star Wars, trying to explain to us things that are kind of Star Wars-like. And he's trying to explain 21st century warfare with a first century mindset, and that's hard to do. He's trying to explain me mechanical machines and computers and all with an agrarian mindset based in 90 AD. And, and he can't, you know, that's why he says guided arrows. That's all he can say. He's talking about missiles, but he, yeah, that's, all, that's all he can come up with. He's an eyewitness. He's traveled through time, and he's attesting to the other, utter truthfulness of what it is he's seen. He is the recorder of actual visions and actual things that he's seen. He is not having bad pepperoni pizza and telling you what he thought he saw last night. He's actually seeing these things. I mean, you eat the right kinds of food or drink the wrong stuff, you'll have all kinds of interesting visions. And, and I learned that if you don't sleep uh, for, for 72 hours straight, you'll see things dancing on the hood of your car, too, that don't really exist. Don't do it. But John didn't have that happen. He's actually seeing real things, real stuff happen. And he's overwhelmed. He's just absolutely overwhelmed by what he's witnessed, what he's seen, what he's heard. And he hears the voice of Jesus saying, I'm coming quickly, and he drops to his knees to worship. But he's at the wrong place. He's in front of an angel. He's not in front of Jesus. I can understand that. I, I thoroughly get it. And the angel quickly corrects him, don't worship me because I'm a created being. Don't worship any created being. <laughs> Do you think that's a problem for believers today? That we have a tendency to worship sometimes created beings? There's several denominations that have problems with that. Um, I'm going to be, I'm just going to name one of them. The veneration and adoration of Mary to the point of almost making her godlike. She's a created being. You're not supposed to do that. Or people who come out and say, well, you know, you should ask an angel to come and take care of you and and communicate with you. No, 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 no. We're not told to do that. If they come and talk to us, it's, they initiate it. Otherwise, if I'm initiating it, uh, I may be talking to an angel who's got a bad problem at the end of the age. Okay? So, because uh, they're going to control the conversation, not me. No saint or angel worship has the approval of heaven. Period. At all. Dr. Seiss said that back in the 1850s. And we still have a tendency to kind of forget that sometimes. But no saint or angel worship has the approval of heaven. It 
doesn't. If it was wrong to worship the heavenly messenger, an angel, that's his job description. His job description, angelos in the Greek just means messenger. Well, if that's if you can't worship him, then you can't worship now either. So you can't pray to the Virgin Mary, you can't worship the Virgin Mary, you can't assign any dignity to the office. It's just not possible because it's wrong. The, the Bible just says don't worship any created being, period. Don't pray to a saint, don't pray, you, you can't, we can't do it. It says no. The impulse and intention may be devout and good, but it's a mistake, and this is the second time John tried to do it, by the way. And it's the second time he's been corrected. And I think he, you know, and, and I, again, I see the angels, and ooh, don't. The last guy that did that got in real big trouble. Don't do that, please. So I, I, I get it. I understand. Not only do angels refuse worship, but when you look at the greatest commandment, which is Exodus 20, verse 3, worship the Lord your God and him only you'll serve, we're not to worship them either. We're not. Divine status, which is what an angel is, does not entitle them to worship. They are created beings. Remember in Colossians 2, verses 18 to 23, Paul actually talked about that, that some folks were worshiping angels. You're not supposed to do that. So if anybody has the book, How to, How to Get in Contact with Your Guardian Angel, don't. It, it, we're not supposed to do that. We're just not. John made a mistake. He was corrected. And he's called a fellow servant by this divine being. Now stop and think about that for a minute. An angel who is constantly in front of God, who was created by God and serves the Lord and sees him on a regular basis and has this, is eternal from the point of creation, considers us fellow servants. We're fellow servants with a whole bunch of, of the heavenly host you got friends in high places like you've never even considered because he's saying, hey, I'm a servant just like you are. And in fact, he, he, you know, he, he even goes into it, says, I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. That's us. We're his fellow servants. So every time you read about the heavenly host, yeah, those are my friends. I'm a servant with them. You know, Michael and Gabriel, hey, we're going to be buds at some point. Not right now, but we're going to know them. And quite honestly, the Bible says at some point we'll actually be higher than them and we're going to be involved with judging those who kind of blew it. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to know them. We're going to get to know who they are. But John's in the same place now that da Daniel was. When Daniel received his views of the end back in Daniel chapter 12, remember what, what was told to Daniel? Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. So Daniel kind of kept it all under wraps. He had all this interesting vision, but it was all sealed. But now in the book of Revelation, everything that Daniel said was going to happen is happening, and we're seeing what Daniel was talking about. And now it's not sealed, because we all have a need to know, and because Jesus is coming very, very soon, that message of sealing it, John doesn't get it. Timing's everything. Verse 10 of chapter 22, this angel tells John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. He, in other words, everybody needs to know what this book says. The time is near. There's that quickness, nearness. Again, let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who's filthy still be filthy, and let the one who's righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy will keep himself holy. In other words, he's saying there are going to be people who are going to read this, hear it, and they're going to continue to do their thing, whatever it is. But it's coming. Don't seal up the word. This book is open to all believers. Remember, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, that's us, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. We're supposed to know everything that's in this book, which amazes me how few people actually study it anymore and how few churches really get into it. That's why we want to know it. We want to know what's in this book. We want to, we want to know because there's a promise of blessing, 
And Jesus would, thought it was important enough to be personally involved to make sure that John understood this. So I guess it's important to him too. In the book of Revelation, much of the book of Daniel has been fulfilled. It's done. Clarified, expanded, detailed, and expanded. It's, it's, it's done. So when John is in contrast to Daniel, John's not sealing up the book. He's laying it all out so that we can understand. The problem is because John makes over 800 references to the Old Testament, and we're not real good at studying the Old Testament. Some of it still kind of goes, what does that mean? So Lord willing, I, we've been able to unpack that over the, over the past few months, especially with all the references back and forth to the Old Testament and trying to understand that when John says things, he's assuming, oh yeah, you know this, right? Yeah, no, we don't, because we don't study the Old Testament like he did. But all prophecy can now be understood, and its fulfillment, by the way, can start at any second. Any second. Uh, what Daniel prophesied is now understood. Because the latter days have begun. Jesus said that. They have already begun. Things are being fulfilled. Israel's back in the land. Ooh. That's the number one sign right there. They're already back. You start looking at that and go, hmm, are there wars and rumors of wars? Oh, you bet. What have we been dealing with over the past week with the, the crazy people who think they're in charge over in Iran? Wars and rumors of wars, we got that going, big time. And John was told, don't seal up the words. The end time prophecies of the Old Testament, especially those in Daniel, have begun to be fulfilled. That's what he's saying. It has started. And we can point to things that were predicted in the Old Testament that have happened already. We know it. The language about not sealing the book indicates the beginning of fulfillment, but it also says because of that, we have greater insight into what Daniel said and what the Old Testament prophets said because we are seeing it happen. We, one of the things Daniel said was there's going to be wisdom knowledge going all over the planet. It is now. You know, it's called the internet. It's called communication. It's called, you name it, it's happening. But Christ's death, resurrection, and reign over history, as well as the saints' tribulation, are all beginning to be fulfilled as a result of what was prophesied in the Old Testament. It's all now taking place, or has taken place. How we view the content of the book of Revelation, and again, it's faithful and true, no falseness in it is discussed in verse 11, but it also says, Daniel 12, those who don't understand that prophecies being fulfilled will continue, as it says here, they'll continue in their sin, they'll continue to be uh, wrong and still do wrong. One who's filthy will still be filthy. People who study this, they don't get it. That's what they're going to continue to do. But believers who study it and get it, it says that they, one who is righteous will still practice righteousness. We'll just be a, we realize the need for obedience. And that's what this is about. Those who don't get it will continue in their sin. Those who do get it will be obedient. Verse 10 of Daniel chapter 12, many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Daniel is pointing to another generation of believers who will have insight and will get it. And what Jesus is saying is that those of us who are his bondservants, believers in Jesus Christ, we're those who are going to have insight and will understand. That's, that's being fulfilled just by us studying the book of Revelation. We'll have that insight and we'll understand what's going on. Verses 12 and 13 of Revelation 22. Jesus talking again. Behold, I am coming quickly. Is this the second time he said this now? And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Christ is speaking again. And once again he places emphasis on his imminent, sudden coming. If there's any doubt that Jesus is coming at any second, Jesus is wanting to eliminate that doubt. And he's talking in 90 A.D. and giving this to John. So 2,000 years later, is, are we any closer? Oh yeah, because we see more things being fulfilled. 
He's coming soon, he's coming suddenly, and he uses that same word. Same one that we talked about. In Isaiah 47, 11, you notice we're going back and forth to Isaiah a lot. Not intentional, just works out that way. Isaiah is a pretty good prophet. Evil will come on you which you will not know how to charm away. He's talking about the end of the age. He says people won't be able to figure out how to get rid of it. You can't charm it away. You can't, you, you, it, it, disaster will fall on you for which you cannot atone. And destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly. Same word, except it's in the Hebrew, but he's, it's the same point. Once it starts, it happens quickly and suddenly. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, therefore be on the alert. For you don't know what today your Lord is coming. It could be today, could be tomorrow, could be five minutes from now. We don't know. My great-grandfather, who's now with the Lord, because he saw Israel go into the land, he was excited and really was expecting Jesus to come before he would go home to be with the Lord. But now he's home with the Lord. His daughter thought the same thing. She's now home with the Lord. We keep expecting the Lord to come at any second because that's what he says. And as believers, that's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live with that expectation, which means the message that we're communicating to this lost world is not just a message of hope, but it's also one of, hey, there's a rescue mission that's getting ready to take place. The train is fixing to leave. You better get on board. Because when it happens, it's, it's, left, it's left the station and there's no coming back. Christ continues with that allusion to Isaiah 40 verse 10 and Isaiah 62 11. And, and Isaiah 40 verse 10, behold the Lord God will come with might with his arm ruling for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. Isaiah 62 verses 11 and 12, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth Say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they'll call him, they'll call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you'll be called sought out a city not forsaken. In that section of Isaiah, we see part of the reward, part of it is the fact that the redeemed return with Jesus to planet earth. We're part of that reward, but we're also receiving rewards at the same time. It's, 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 kind of tough to understand, but you know, when you say what reward is coming with Christ, well, yeah, we're part of the reward. We're given to the, God's given us as a, to, to, to Jesus, but also Jesus has promised to give everyone according to what they've done. So we've got, we've got that reward to look forward to. Jeremiah talks about it in chapter 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. And even to give to each man according to his way, according to the results of his deeds. We're not saved by works, but once we're saved, uh, I like the way Dr. Uh, Missler talks about it, once you're saved, Jesus asks the question, what have you done with it lately? Are we living for him? Are we serving him? Does, it, does being saved, being a follower of Jesus, make us want to be obedient to what he says, or are we busy doing our own thing in disobedience to what he says? He is going to personally reward each believer individually. You and I have a job evaluation coming up with the king of the universe where he's going to sit down across from us and say, so let's talk about your life from the moment that you gave your life to me. Everything else is done. He's not going to talk about any of that other stuff. He just, what have we done for him? And he's going to know and we're going to know. You've been listening to a message from Revelation on the Unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this final book of the Bible. If you're into fantasy or sci-fi, you might be naturally drawn toward Revelation. There's all kinds of imagery and strange creatures that are described. But more than any of this, you're reminded of the preeminence of God and that He rules over everything. He rules over all people, nations, and he has more power than the evil that can try to take over the world. What a relief that you can know and trust in this God. Are you confused about anything you heard today? Don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. 
Once there, go to the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. Then you can fill out a form for us to get in touch with you. To listen to this message or any others from this series in Revelation, just look under the Media tab at the unsafebible.com. You'll also find additional teachings in other books of the Bible. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you have the opportunity to help support the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. We're grateful for any donation given to help further the message of the gospel. Any other questions? Feel free to explore the unsafebible.com. For more information about when and where we meet, we're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and would be happy to meet you. Join us again here for another message from the book of Revelation on the Unsafe Bible.